April 2nd, 2014. The day I decided that instead of attending my classes at the University of Florida, I was going to drive six hours northwest to fish the legendary Panhandle Piers. Now, there was only one species I would risk failing calculus for. Every April, they migrate from east to west along the beaches of Florida's Panhandle. These robust brown fish are sight fished on top with either a hand-tied jig or a live bait and are known to be one of the most aggressive feeders of any species. They're called by dozens of names. Ling, lemonfish, mud shark, but most people know them as cobia. On April 7th, when I finally was able to step foot on one of these piers, I was blown away by how legendary this fishery was. The amount of fish that were coming through and the amount of guys just on the pier that were catching giant cobia blew me away. And on April 9th, 2014, I landed a stud 47 pound fish, average by local standards, but an amazing fish for an East Coast guy like myself. And yes, missing a week of university did lead to me failing a class or two. Devastating at the time, just a funny story these days. Fast forward to today. We've been afforded the opportunity to fish with a local guide out of Pensacola, Florida. For the next three days, we will be searching the coast for a huge migrating cobia with the ultimate goal of winning this year's local cobia tournament. With over $100,000 up for grabs this weekend, it's make the most of your opportunities or go home completely empty handed. Good morning, everyone. Today we're out in Pensacola, Florida. We're trying to do some cobia fishing. We got Phil. What's up, guys? Doing some great stuff for saltwater sports, and, and we're fishing with Captain Miles Howell, hey, tradition fishing charters. He's gonna try and put me on a fish bigger than 71 pounds. That'd be great, yeah. <laughs> Let's go for 86. That That's sounds it. phenomenal, because I have never thought that I was gonna be able to beat 71, but this is an area that you might actually be able to do it, so we're gonna get out there. It's gonna be a couple hard days of fishing, but I'm really excited for it. We're catching a little bit of bait while we're waiting for the last member of our party to show up, and this is a little pinfish. They are spiky SOBs, but they make great bait. This one's just a little bit too small for what we want, so he's gonna live to see another day. Just got pretty much a chicken rig with a little bit of squid. You guys can't really see it, but just a little goldy hook with a touch of squid. Get that on there, nothing very fancy. Number 10 gold hook. Hook it a couple times so they don't steal all my bait. Oh, that's where the big ones are? Yeah. Chris, Chris found the honey hole for the giants. Oh, literally before it hits the bottom, they were on it. Oh, they cleaned me out. Did me dirty. Yep. Round two. Woo! There, there we you go. go. There we go. Wow. These are what we want. They're so spiky. But you gotta think, you throw want. that out, freaking out on top, it doesn't it doesn't know where it is once you pull it out of the live well and throw it back in the water and hopefully he swims into a big cobia's mouth. Oh, there you go. See that hook set? Yep, that was awesome. That was, that was it. That was pro, pro staff. <laughs> That's that bro staff stuff, boys. With a full live well and a full crew, we loaded up and we were off. During the six mile run out to Pensacola Pass, Captain Miles and I traded stories about cobia fishing over the years, and he gave us a little bit of insight into the disappearing populations in this area. We'll touch more on the state of cobia populations in this area and in other areas later in the video. Yeah, we killed a bunch in the 90s and 2000s, and then the oil spill happened. Yep. And you know, it just, uh, it, then a couple years later, we had a few decent years, but it's just, you know, then now they stopped all the big tournaments are only basically one tournament a year. It's a little weekend. It's not a whole lot of effort. And they it's not cut a lot. the regulations. They too. cut the regulations down. I mean, it's been 13 years since the oil spill, and the fish hadn't really come back. Yeah. So something, you know, so many people love these fish. There's been a lot of tagging studies and all, but I'd love for my kids to be able to go out here and do it like I did. Yeah. I mean, you don't need six of them, you know. No. One or Especially two. Especially when you're catching 50 plus pounds. Right. One or, one or two per boat is more than enough.
I don't know if you guys can tell, it's a little rocking and rolling out here. We're gonna climb up the tower. Hopefully we don't fall. It's a little, a little slippery. Climbing up into the tower on day one, I kind of felt like a baby deer taking its first steps. It was about two to four, and the higher up you get, the more you feel the rocking and rolling on a boat. So we got up here and we were trying to set up to get ready to Kobe a fish. We have two buckets ready for live baits that we need to strap into the tower and then fill up with some fresh salt water to be ready for our baits. Next up, I have to drop a treble hook from the tower down to the deck of the boat where Captain Miles is going to wrangle one of these wacky looking eels, put a hook right behind its head, and then we're going to get it in the bucket as quick as we can. These eels will ball up on themselves and essentially, you know, screw your line all up and you won't be able to use them. So you have to watch them almost at all times to make sure they're chilling in the bucket. In the other bucket, we put a live pinfish and then we are essentially ready to go up in the tower looking for a cobia on top. So we got three of us up here in the tower and we kind of have the water divided in a, like three sections, overlapping areas, and we're all kind of breaking it down, trying to see if we could see a fish swimming on top. We're looking for a big cobia that's gonna be migrating from the east to the west, um, and we're just kind of looking in different areas, deeper, shallower, seeing if we find them. We have ourselves rigged up with a couple of live baits, and then we also have two jig rods behind me. So primarily we're gonna use the jig rods to tease smaller fish away if there happens to be a smaller fish with a big fish want to be able to get the uh, live bait in front of the big fish because they typically are a little bit more finicky and you're going to pull a lot less hooks when you're hooking them with like a treble hook than if you hook them with a big heavy jig so real cloudy not great visibility out here we're looking hard my eyes are already starting to hurt but hopefully we find something um seeing a big school of bait out here so there is some life we're going to keep looking so it's been over nine years since my first encounter with this fishery and i knew that the population of fish had taken a hit but I didn't know to what extent until I had a chance to kind of speak with Captain Miles, experience this fishery for myself, and do a little bit of side research. In the 1970s and 1980s, cobia fishing started to really gain popularity. There were good numbers of fish seen, but not nearly as many as that were seen in the 1990s and the 2000s. Maybe it was due to an increase in people fishing or improved techniques, but many old salts claim this was the heyday of cobia fishing. There were so many big fish and so many numbers of fish seen during this era. In 2010, the BP oil spill happened in the Gulf, and that's what many people attribute to the start of the downfall of these fish. But as I saw in the early 2010s, there was still a healthy population of bigger fish. Many believe this is because the oil spill didn't affect fish that had already reached maturity. It did affect the eggs and the growth of new hatchlings, which is now why 10 to 15 years later, we're really feeling the effects in Florida's panhandle. Many disagree with the oil spill theory and think most of the lack of population is due to overfishing, too many tournaments, too many harvests of big breeder fish. It's worth pointing out that there's still strong populations of fish other places in the country, but more on that later. Can you give me an update, Captain? What's been going on today? Well, we've been looking real hard. The conditions were nice early, had a nice southeast wind with sun. Now you can see it's overcast. It's still got a little southeast wind, which is good, but the visibility has just been tough. We haven't seen any cobia. Sounds like it's been really slow. Only heard of one, maybe two fish caught. And, you know, I just got a high hope for when the sun comes out here over the next couple days. Um, all I can say is that we're doing everything we can, and yeah. I'm hopeful. Yeah, absolutely. I have been, I haven't moved from this tower spot since like 8 this morning, and now it's about 3 o'clock, 3.30. Yeah. Um, so, really got to pee, really got to eat something, <laughs> but I'm, I'm holding out hope. want to make the most of every opportunity we can to maybe catch a fish. Saltwater Sportsman Magazine is making it possible for myself and a bunch of my friends to go out and document epic fisheries and unique fisheries just like this one. So for more information on these adventures, go down and click the link below. We gave it our all, but on day one, we came up empty-handed. Out of 31 tournament boats, only two fish, I believe, were caught on day one, and none had any size to them. 7 a.m. I walk on the dock, and I find out that Captain Miles has had one heck of a morning. He walks out early in the morning to find that the live well pump had died. All of our pinfish and all of our eels did not make it through the evening. So he had to go out of his way to secure some eels for us from a local tackle shop. And we had to take the time to catch more pinfish because we could not go out there without having live bait to throw at a big fish. 
So welcome, welcome to day two. We are on our way out. We didn't hook any fish yesterday, right? But you might have one shot to hook these fish. You might have one shot at these fish. So you want to make sure everything is good. So stripped off an extra couple feet of line. Make sure there's no frays, no nothing like that. Retie the knots, make sure everything's strong and ready to go because you never know when that big fish is gonna come and you wanna be ready and you wanna make sure that you've done everything within your control to catch that fish, you know? It's the most fun part of the day, is catching bait. Everything else is work. Most important job of catching bait, the de hooker. Big haul. It's another species of baits. It's a pig fish. Use these for snook and reds back home. Definitely bet a Kobe will eat one of these. It's cold and windy up here today. We're gonna get a bait on ready to go. A lot more sun today than there was yesterday, so we should be able to see a whole heck of a lot better. With the day of fishing under our belt, the boat started to feel less like a Maj Paj group of guys and more like a well-oiled machine, ready to go and ready to make the most of our fishing opportunities. All right, we got the eel calmed down, I think. I think he's just chilling now. And we are up here for the foreseeable future. We looked long and hard, passing by other boats, holding up zero, saying that they hadn't caught any fish either. And we get to the afternoon. We see a bait school up ahead and decide because there just hasn't been that much life, we're going to go check out that bait school. And as we're pulling up to the bait school, we're all staring at it. And then suddenly, a cobia shoots out from underneath the bow, presumably spooked by our boat, and he shoots off to my left side. I excitedly grab the eel, treble hook gets stuck on the bucket, so it takes me an extra half second to present a cast, cast out, and my eel lands right on the tail of this cobia. Get it? Real, 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 real. He's, he's on it, he's on it, he's on it. He's on, he's on, he's on. Okay. Let him run, let him run. We're on, we're on. Go check that drag. Oh, he's pissed now. Oh, he's he's pissed off now. Yeah, I just did a little bit. We're on. We we're on. We are tight with the yeah. Covia. Woo! Oh my gosh, what did we do? Run him over? I saw him come out from underneath the boat. I know, I know, I know. Woo, buddy, let's go. Oh, he's pissed. He's jumping. Yep. Woo. Right, let's run the rod All right. down. Sounds good. All right, I'm going down. Going down. We'll run the rod down. Coming right. down, ready? Yep. Grab the rod. Got the rod. Drop the rod. Let's go. All right, we're on. Woo, let's go. Made a bad cast, he was a little bit too far. The eel caught the bucket, so it took me a half a second more. I casted it, landed on his tail, and he turned around, still started chasing the eel. This fish was hungry. Uh, so we keep the boat in gear, to keep the fish going away from us while we ride the, slide the rod down the line, this little pulley system here. It's not a giant fish, but man, it feels good to actually see a real one. It's been a long, long couple days looking for one of these things. Come on now. It was cool, man, to see him come up and just smoke that eel by himself, yeah. I think we about ran him over because he came shooting out from underneath where the boat was. There he is. There he is. I don't even know, man. He's all right. I got him. Yeah. Woo, there's a fish. Get him in there, get him to calm down. Not a huge fish, not a giant, but man, 
feels good to actually see one, be able to cast at him, man. I'm stoked. Yeah, man. Stoked to be able to get one. Yeah, it's nice to get one after yeah. working so hard. We need a bigger one. But we'll take sure. We got something to eat now. All right, there we have it, y'all. So this fish is measured out at right about 37 inches. Legal fish, nowhere near the size that we want to end this trip on, though. It's a great appetizer, fun fish, cool fight. You know, it was a cool experience because I've never really Kobe a fish like this. Live eel, out of a tower boat with a whole pulley system where we run the rod down. Um, it's a real big team effort. And uh, now that we know how it's gonna go for a big one, we're ready. We're, you know, we're, we're, we got our reps in, we got our practice session in. So we're gonna hope that we're gonna catch a true monster after this. Let's get this guy on ice. I'll be honest, we were very conflicted on whether or not we were going to harvest that fish. Keeping a barely legal fish in a video where you're speaking about the decline of a population of that species is definitely hypocritical, and I understand that. But it's a decision we made, and at this point, we had to live with it. It's not all doom and gloom, though. On Florida's southeast coast, you can still find huge numbers of cobia in the springtime. Their patterns seem to have changed over the last couple years, and they tend to follow big bull sharks, which presents its own version of certain problems. But that's a discussion for another day. Throughout the summertime, the Carolinas, Chesapeake Bay, and Virginia Beach see huge numbers of spawning cobia. Sometimes there's reports of 100 to 200 fish seen in one school. So there's definitely huge populations in certain areas. It's also worth noting that across states, there's been a change in regulations in an effort to protect these fish. They've cut the regulations from six per boat all the way down to two. They've changed the minimum size limits and they've set seasons in some states in order to try and protect this fish, which is relatively fast growing. Plenty of other solutions have been discussed as well, and we'll touch on that later in the video. Day two concluded without seeing another fish, so we headed in to fillet up our one keeper for the day. Alrighty y'all, so we are back at the dock. It was definitely a grind today, but I'm happy that today, unlike yesterday, we were able to actually see one, catch one, get it in the boat. And opposed to me just, you know, cleaning up the fish like usual, I'm gonna actually have Captain Miles show you guys how he likes to clean up the cobia, so maybe we all, we all can learn something. Hey y'all, so first thing I like to do is, I just like to spray the fish off. Just makes it a little easier to handle. Just get some of the slime off. You don't have to do it. It's just something I like to do. From my experience, they're such a pain to work with, especially since they're so round. They, they are, just like and honestly, sometimes what I'll do is I'll drop them down on the dock to cut the sides off. Really? We'll, uh, We'll start up here and see how it goes. Go right in here, make a cut. And then what I like to do, I'll go right down along them. You see their little spines? Just take the tip of the knife, go along the top here. I did the one the other day, I did them on the dock. It just yeah, made I feel it like especially those big fish, it yeah. probably help a lot. So then I just kind of punch through here, knock that out. I use the tip of my knife, I just start going down, right? Start kind of sliding down that backbone. Cubby are real bloody. They're pelagic. They're always swimming. They got a lot of blood pumping through there. Man, so you kind of hop to the other side of the backbone there? Yeah, so they got a real big vertebrae, Cubby do. So yeah, I like to hop over the backbone here and just start cutting down. I kind of work my way like that. I don't know if y'all can see that. I can see it all right. Sun's getting low. I'm gonna hop up here and kind of do some of the same stuff. And at some point here, we're gonna bust through some of the the guts and the backbone and all that. Kobe got a lot of guts. Smelly guts too. Yeah, These they do. <laughs> stinky fish. They man. are. They are. Why do you think it is that they're stinky? I think it's probably what they eat. I think it makes the meat taste good. But as we all know, if you ever leave a crab or some shrimp or something in your cooler and let it get old. Any kind of rotting crustaceans that really tend to get funky on you. So here now, we're gonna kind of peel this thing open here, as you can see. And we're just gonna kind of cut down in here. All right, that's free to go right there. So there's one filet. That's about as good as we're gonna get around here. So. We'll just flip over, we'll do the exact same thing on the other side. Alrighty. And then we'll then we'll uh, show you how to skin them. Go down here, make a little incision, start to turn the knife. And cobia do have a lot of different red meat in the filet. So, you know, with some fish, you really want to get real tight to that skin. I actually find with cobia, if you ride just a little high, 
you actually will have a little bit better fillet. I mean, they, they do have some waste. So just kind of push. I like to twist the fillet, the skin like this. And as you can see, did pretty nice. good there. That's a nice hunk of meat. Nice hunk of meat. Left a little meat right here because there, that is a lot of, you can see all this red. That's the blood. I mean, you're not, you are going to cut that out anyway. Mm -hmm. Kind of like when you clean a bigger redfish. Very similar. So yeah, we're just going to uh, finish cleaning this uh, cobia up here and they'll be ready to cook. It's going to have us a nice dinner. Well, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. I think we learned something. Yes, sir. You're welcome. Welcome to day three. We, I don't know if I've mentioned it yet, but we are actually fishing a Cobia tournament. There's 31 boats and not one fish has actually been weighed yet because there's a 45 pound minimum. There's been multiple fish up to like 42 pounds that have been, you know, attempted to be weighed, but there's not one legal fish in this tournament yet. Today is the last day of the tournament. So we are looking for a big fish, looking for, you know, like a true, like 70, 80 pounder, but you know, it might just be a, Typical Pensacola average size, 45, 50 pound fish that wins today. So we're gonna grind it out. We've been fishing hard. We're gonna keep fishing and uh, excited to go. The sun's in the air. We're gonna get after it. We are up the tower again, man. It feels like this tower's become my second home out here. But we're spending some time checking out a couple areas that Cobia could just be hanging out, um, doing something different because something's got to give with these fish. We're going to keep on looking, check these couple areas, and then get back to it, finding where the fish are going to be. The conditions look as good as we've, or, you know, the best that we've seen the entire trip right now. Fingers crossed that all that comes together and we find that big fish we've been looking for. Okay, y'all, so. A lot of you guys might come to Pensacola and you might want to do some fishing and I wouldn't recommend Cobia fishing for a lot of people. Cat Miles does all types of charter fishing all year round. So what, what's like, what do you like to take like families and stuff to do? I'd say the number one family type trips is going to be going out in the Gulf and doing some bottom fishing. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people would maybe call it deep sea fishing. Yeah. Six and eight hour charters going out to catch a uh, red snapper. Vermilion, Mingo, Beeliner, however you know them, all the same fish. And those uh, are all really good to eat. All really good to eat. Inshore side, we catch a lot of redfish, Spanish mackerel, a few speckled trout, some flounder, mangrove snappers. We definitely got options. And you don't need to know how to fish, do you? No, absolutely not. That's the thing I have to explain to people that 90% of the people we take have either never went or mm -hmm. go once a year or every other year. and. Uh, and we have a lot of success, you know, we got a good crew, a good team of captains and mates, and we'll take good care of you and show you a good time and send you home with something to eat most of the time. On day three, the beach seemed to be alive. We were seeing tons of bait and just tons of activity. And then suddenly, Cap Miles screams out, look at that thing. And there was this fish cruising on top, the last thing we expected to see, a giant sailfish. It's a sailfish. It's a oh sailfish. my God. Put that bait out there. Put that bait out there. No, it didn't even look at it really. Oh damn, that's beautiful. <laughs> you see that? Yeah, that thing was sick. It's still there. Yeah. We were seeing everything it seemed like except for a cobia. We pulled up on this big banner ray, which cobia will typically follow, and there definitely wasn't a big cobia on it. There was blue runners behind it, there was plenty of remoras, but unfortunately what we were looking for was not home. Big manta ray. How are you empty, you SOB? Unbelievable. Reality was starting to set in. It seemed like this trip might be a bust. We got on the radio, talked to other boats. There had been a fish or two that were caught, but weren't. there wasn't any size to them. And we started heading back towards Pensacola because, you know, there was only going to be so many hours of daylight and we might as well make our way back towards our home inlet. It's around 4.15 p.m. The front of the boat is basically all glare, so I'm looking off to the left side of the boat and kind of behind us. Captain Miles and I are talking about my upcoming trip to Panama, and suddenly, this unmistakable bronze fish pops up on my side of the boat. I scream, Cobia, 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 grab my bait, 
flick it out. The fish is basically behind the boat at this point, and I put the eel right in front of his face. We completely lose sight of the fish in the white wash of the boat, and I just free spool, close my bail, reel, and then this happens. I don't know. Oh yeah, yeah, he's there. Got him. Go away from got him. Got him. Got him. Got him. Woo! <laughs> 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 Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go, buddy. Let's go. Oh my gosh, son. Woo! Woo! I'm loosening a little bit. Let's go. Here. Ready? Yep. All right, good. Coming down. <laughs> grabbing the butt. Grabbing the butt. Not the line. Grabbing the butt. You ready? Ready. Coming down. Sorry. Coming down. Grab the butt of the rod. Butt of the rod. Got it. Okay. Got the clip. Clips off. Tight on the fish. Oh my gosh, that was sick. Crazy how fast he just popped up, man. Popped up out of nowhere. Woo! Woo, we on? Y'all, wow, three days of fishing. <laughs> Get this fish, I'm almost speechless right now, man. That fish came out of absolute nowhere. Me and Phil are talking about the next trip we might be able to go on. Crazy, and that fish just popped up right there, just cruising. Hey, Cap, was he going the wrong way? Uh, yeah. Wow, man, I just did not even expect to see him, man. Just came out of nowhere, stuck it, sticking out like a sore thumb in that green water. Crazy, y'all. Yeah, he's just cruising on top now. Definitely a lot bigger than the one yesterday. Say that. Such a cool fish, man. Such a cool fish. Not much, not many things in this world get me fired up like a Cobia cruising on top. Whew. Oh my gosh, man. Crazy. Yes, sir. Woo! We're going to death, baby. <laughs> Come on in, fish. Come check out the fever reliever. Come say hi. Woo hoo hoo. Captain's keeping the boat in gear. Helps keep the fish tight. Keep them on. Keeps, keeps them in the back of the boat too so I don't have to run around the boat. You know, you know, run, run into issues where the fish can like get you on the prop and stuff like that. So everyone's doing their job right now. I don't know, we'll see. I don't like making any estimates before I actually get the fish in the boat. It's bigger than yesterday, that's all we're saying. Look at that brown fish in that emerald water. Isn't that a pretty sight? Oh, he's not, he's not happy with us at all. We put a hook in his face. These fish have some of the hardest head shakes out of any fish that you can catch. They get angry and they just shake their head back and forth. Real mean, real nasty. And they're all weird when they fight. Some of them will just swim straight up to the boat. Some of them will fight you harder than any other fish in the ocean. And some of them, like this one, will just kind of dog you. Angry fish, man, just sounding down again. Yeah, the eel is in his face angry man Woo! tensions are high right now on the fever reliever we all want this fish bad at this point we knew no fish oh, no, meeting right. the tournament minimum of 45 pounds had been weighed in so this fish if it meets that minimum weight of 45 pounds could win this boat around twenty thousand dollars in daily prizes and the overall tournament pot oh man Sounding down, getting close, but sounding down a little bit. Whoa! 
singing. He saw the boat and he did not like our ugly mugs. Come on up, buddy. Staying down now. Staying down. Wow, man. <laughs> Crazy, powerful fish. Definitely, you know, keeping the boating gear so, you know, we keep him where he needs to be. But that adds to the length of the fight, you know, with some of these fish because you're fighting the tension of the boat where the boat is applying. There he is. See him cruising again, back up on top. Big, brown, and in charge. Ooh, what a pretty sight. What a pretty sight. Come say hi to the fever reliever. Wow. Damn. Pissed. Pissed off. Can't imagine how long a fight would be on like an 80 pounder, you know what I mean? Be a real long fight. I was joking with the guys that we were gonna fight this cobia longer than I fought my 200 pound yellowfin in Mexico. And in reality, we actually ended up doing that exact thing because this total fight time was right around like, I would say like 17, 18 minutes based on my GoPro clips, which is hilarious because I landed that big yellowfin in like eight, nine minutes. I feel like we've done this already. Come on up fish. Yeah, the runs are getting a little shorter. See him turning sideways. He's spinning. Come on, fish. talk about a grind of a weekend it's been a grind of a weekend that fish is gonna be real close there hasn't been anything weighed all weekend these things will fool you they're like a tuna sometimes they weigh more than they look less than they look there's a 45 pound minimum it's gonna be real close real close that fish is real thick I'm hopeful I'm excited it's worth the boat ride after everything we've done this weekend we're gonna go hang it up and at least uh you know, get our picture. On the two hour ride to Destin, we hopped on the radio and found out that two other boats were gonna be weighing in fish around the same size as ours. We weren't sure if we were gonna win, but man, that ride to Destin was a ton of fun. We were just happy we were competing. No. As we pulled into the scales, there was something very unexpected for me. There was a whole crowd of people waiting to just see a fish get weighed in. You could clearly see how special Cobia is to this community in this area. We got word that the first of three fish weighed in at 44.7, so that fish did not count for the tournament either. Now there was only our fish and one other to even compete. Our fish was hoisted up onto the scale. You could hear the disappointment in the crowd. Our fish came in right around 40 to 41 pounds. 
under the 45 minimum needed for the tournament for it to count. Oh, well. You guys want to get some photos? Yeah, we'll take a quick sure. photo with it. Come on. The final fish weighed in at 47 pounds, so someone got to take home some prize money. Very unfortunate turnout for this tournament. Our team definitely left a little bit disappointed. Alrighty, y'all. So, didn't give you guys a chance to see this fish much. It's a 40 pound fish. We thought it could have been, you know, up to like 50 pounds, but didn't win us the tournament. You needed a 45 pound pitch to count. This fish didn't qualify. It was about 40, a little over. And then, uh, 47 pound fish ended up winning the whole tournament. So definitely a tough three days of fishing. Nothing like it typically is here in Pensacola, but when you go fishing, you have to deal with the deck of cards that you are dealt. And man, we fished really hard. We put the, put our time in, put the effort in, and it paid off with this big fish to end the trip, man. So very appreciative of this fish. It's definitely gonna feed our friends and family. Just a little bit disappointed we didn't have a chance at the money in the tournament. But I will see you guys back at my place where we are going to cook up some delicious Kobe recipe. See you guys there. I love catching these fish, and I also love eating these fish. But I would love for future generations to be able to do the same thing that I've had so much enjoyment doing. So some possible solutions to the lack of Kobe in the Gulf have been presented by certain individuals. Some want a moratorium on keeping Kobe for two, three, four years at a time to allow the populations to come back in Florida's panhandle. I think a creative solution could be some sort of stocking program. Certain saltwater species have been successfully stocked in the Gulf already. Cobia have also proven to be easily farmable by companies like Open Blue Cobia that essentially farm these fish. These fish grow insanely fast, so they are a prime candidate for a program like this. Call me ignorant, but so many people love this fish, so I think a creative solution to get it back in the waters in a sustainable way could definitely benefit our communities. I'll equate fishing to global warming. There's always going to be some natural change in patterns, some natural change in the world without our human impact. But I think most would agree that humans have some sort of impact on the fisheries and the debate lies in how much impact we do have and what we should do to fix our impact. So I am very much open to any suggestions or disagreements or whatever you guys have to say down in the comment section below. This is an amazing fish that I think needs to stick around and I would love for future generations to be able to catch and eat these awesome fish. Welcome back to Southeast Florida. I'm here with my beautiful girlfriend, Christina. We are in the kitchen. She has been slaving away, chopping up a bunch of ingredients. What are we making? We're making cobia tacos with beans and coconut rice. So we are starting out with our avocado puree that we're gonna do. So it's like a little avocado cilantro lime. So we are gonna go in with about two avocados to start out with. Also going to add the juice of one lime. All right, now we'll add a little bit of freshly chopped cilantro. Add a little bit of sour cream. It's going to give it a little bit creamier. Dash of water too. That was the biggest dash of water I've ever seen. This is definitely much more of an art than a science. I always tend to add a little bit of salt to taste and then also water until it's the proper consistency. I like it pretty easy to work with, so I'll just keep adding little dashes of water to it. So what are we making over here, babe? Um, so we are making uh, coconut rice with toasted coconut flakes. So. Um, we use jasmine rice, half coconut milk, and half water. We have our beautiful toasted coconut over here, which we put in the oven at 325. And you've, um, been, uh, you've been snacking on this, haven't you? It's, oh, it's pretty good, isn't it? It's so good. Um, so we're gonna fluff the Not rice. Bad. We're gonna fluff the rice and then just add the coconut flakes in and it adds um, this more- This sweet. Yeah, it adds um, more flavor and more texture too. And we baked these for 10 minutes and I flipped halfway through. So we got a really nice golden brown. And actually I'm just kind of folding it and fluffing it at the same time. So I already said it once in the video, but I kind of want to say it again, how we were a little bit conflicted on keeping that smaller fish and we ultimately decided to. And um, just very appreciative of this fish that we were able to bring home. Was able to give some to a lot of uh, Captain Howell's family and friends. 
I was able to take some home. I'm gonna have a wonderful meal with my girlfriend and get to share it with you guys and show you guys how awesome these fish are and how much I really appreciate them and the opportunity to get to catch them, cook them, and clean them. So here we have our cobia right here. Very firm feeling. It's been in the cooler for a couple days now, but it should be ready to go in a delicious taco. Since we are doing a taco recipe, I'm gonna cut these into taco size portions. So taco size strips, Christina says. I'm not using the proper vernacular, I guess. But using the Danko Pro Series here, you guys remember you can always save using my code, RyanMori10 on Danko products. German steel blades and lifetime warranty on their products. So great company that I'm happy to be working with. I'm gonna go in with some garlic powder on the fish. Actually leaving two uncut pieces. Um, I'm gonna show you guys another presentation that you could do with the very similar with, the, with this recipe. A Little bit of chili powder, a little paprika, and then some salt and pepper. All right, we're going in with our bigger pieces of fish first because they're gonna take the longest to cook. These smaller pieces are gonna cook pretty quick. You don't need to overcrowd the pan or anything like that. Just doing a quick steamed zucchini too, just so we have, Christina and I felt like we needed a little bit more vegetables in our life. I do really notice a difference whenever I toast my tortillas. Just, you know, heat them up in a pan a little bit, low heat and the flavor that it brings out I think is significantly better than just a straight tortilla out of the package. I think it's well worth the 10 to 15 seconds that it takes to just heat everyone up. Okay, back by popular demand, the plating wars. Everyone has to see whose plate is better, whether it's gonna be Christina's or Ryan's. And I think everyone is biased because Christina's a lot prettier than me, so they always say that her plate looked better. And I don't believe you guys. Uh, you're getting rice all over the floor. Big rice girl. <laughs> Put it on. We're gonna go do cardio tomorrow. I'm taking some fish sticks. Just putting them on there. I'm picking the best ones again. <laughs> Cause you let me go. You let me go first. I'm gonna take some red cabbage and just sprinkle it on. I'm gonna take some of this. <laughs> Whoa! Did you hear that thunder? <laughs> It's because I put, I'm making my plate look so good. <laughs> okay, well, obviously that didn't turn out very good. Maybe I lose this round, but a little bit of cheese. A little bit of lime, because I really like lime. A wonderful little taco. What are you going to get before I even get to the table? Mmm. -hmm. <laughs> Pretty good? Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. I am actually gonna do my cobia two ways. So I'm actually gonna start out with a little bit of puree straight on the plate. And grab some of our coconut rice that we're gonna have for the next year. We have so much, but it's okay. I like rice. We overcooked the zucchini a little bit, but that's just because we decided to make 15 different things that I don't know. Me and Christina were both just like, oh, that sounds good. Let's do that. Let's do that too. We're gonna do one of the bigger pieces of fish, one roll. Oh yeah. That actually doesn't look that bad. Yeah, what are you doing? What are you laughing at? You, I didn't know we were making it two different ways, otherwise we would have put it on a different plate and made it look a lot nicer. No, it looks perfect. That area. Uh, 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 uh. This is all wonderful. This is all goodness. <laughs> we're gonna come in little cobia tacos. We'll get a little saucy on the tacos. Touch of cabbage, a little bit of tomato. Comment down below if you guys don't like tomatoes because Christina hates tomatoes and I love tomatoes. So let me know down below if you guys are on team tomato or not. And then finally, everything's better with just a little bit of cheese. Oh my gosh, <laughs> catastrophized. <laughs> okay, what did you think? Uh, I really liked it. I liked it more than the... Um... Pompano? Yes. That's what we did last time. Uh, I thought it was very flavorful, very tender. Um, 
The only thing I didn't like about the whole entire recipe was the cilantro in the puree. It was A lot of people don't like cilantro. It was really overpowering and it wasn't my favorite, but other than that, everything was great. Uh, we just are very full now. <laughs> I thought it was delicious. I had no complaints with anything, um, but maybe she, Christina calls me her garbage can, so I don't know, maybe my opinion's a little <laughs> bit biased. You eat all my leftovers yeah. and my unwanted food. Yeah, for sure. But <laughs> I thought it was a great recipe, and this was like, this was a very special video for me. Cobia being one of my favorite fish, a fish that I always wanted to catch growing up, and getting to go and fish for him in this manner in a historically legendary fishery um, was very, very special. So huge shout out to Tradition Fishing Charters, Captain Miles Howell. You guys be sure to go check him out. Um, shout out to Saltwater Sportsman for making this happen. And huge shout out to my wonderful girlfriend for being here and uh, eating, eating food with me, helping me cook, helping me film, and always supporting me. So huge thank you to you. Yeah. yeah. Lastly, if you guys have been liking this video and you guys wanna see another epic adventure similar to this one, Check this video out and I'll see you all over there.